um, at this time, the children uh, can go to their worship time. Um, and actually, they have left, so which is good. And let me highlight some few announcements. Um, the prayer for international workers uh, meet today at um, the conference room after the service. So please, for those of you who partake of this, uh, just make your way to the conference room uh, after the service. <clears throat> and the women uh, are going to the Royal City this uh, Tuesday, 27th. Uh, so please, uh, I'm sure those of you who have given your uh, text to the leadership to know uh, you know where you are gathering to be able to couple to that event. So and I gave you an assignment last week that as you go through uh, the wild and uh, see the flowers, uh, make sure you hear what God is telling you. And uh, I'll be excited to hear what you have to come back. And I'm going to give you time next Sunday to share uh, what, what some of the exciting things that you heard a lot. Um, don't, don't manufacture. Just make sure you heard God. All right. Um, and our prayer meeting this uh, Tuesday um, is going to be focusing on missions. And we want to pray and lift up our international workers, uh, mission, missionaries with the Alliance. And I hope you know that one of the trademark or one of the uh, branding of um, the Alliance is that we are known for international missions. That is what the Alliance are known for. We are strong in that area uh, with a lot of uh, missionaries in areas where others cannot go. So please uh, join us uh, on, when, um, on Tuesday by 6.30 uh, to 7.30 to pray specifically for mission work. And as you know, the, North White, the Northwest District of the Alliance is focusing on Alaska. Alaska seems to have been a neglected field and the district leadership is prioritizing that as something that um, the Northwest district would take seriously. Uh, thank you for participating in the picnic um, on Friday. It was a good time. Uh, the children really had a very good time, except that the whatever the bouncing castle was not put outside because it was cold and windy, uh, but they did what they could do, sliding and all of that. I wanted to see the elderly do that, but they were afraid. But we enjoy our time, and uh, we fellowship together. Uh, some men were very good cook, and so we praise God for that. Um, the Sunday prayer, uh, which is at 8.45, resumed this coming uh, Sunday. And so please, for those of you who have been part of these uh, activities of prayer, uh, we cannot pray enough as uh, we will see we're talking about prayer this morning, and so we want to encourage you uh, to, uh, to be part of this, uh, uh, what God is doing in our midst here. So let me uh, say a word of prayer, and then we'll read the scripture and go into the message. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much again for this opportunity of the time together so far we've had here uh, this morning. We pray as we continue with this worship, and as we look into your word, we are asking, O oh God, to teach us. Holy Spirit, teach us. Teach us, even as the disciples required, or, I mean, uh, requested from Jesus, to teach them how to pray. Teach us, Lord. Give us that desire to want to be students of your word, but also to be students of prayer. I pray, Father, Lord, that... Um, you will use me as a vessel of honor and a vessel of blessing that the words that will come out of my mouth will be an encouragement to someone here this morning. And we pray that, Lord, even the reading of your word will bring blessing to the hearers as we listen to your word read. We surrender to you, Holy Spirit, do what only you alone can do in the hearts of each and every one seated here. Because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to uh, the book of Luke, the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 11. We'll read verse 1 to 13. <clears throat> Luke, chapter 1, 
chapter 11, verse 1 to 13. It goes, One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. Which of you, fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Um, this morning, we will we turn to focus on the ministry of prayer. Uh, remember what we are dealing, um, we, we had considered three Sundays ago uh, the ministry of the word of God. And this is in line with the, um, the commitment of the apostles in Acts chapter 6 where the apostles said we will not be distracted with the ministry of serving food, not because the ministry of serving food is less important, but that because they wanted to give their attention to the ministry of the word and prayer. So we focus our attention on the ministry of the word. Today we turn, today and next Sunday, we turn on the ministry of prayer. What does that mean? What, why is this so important that the apostles would choose to prioritize these two ministries, the ministry of the word and the ministry of prayer? Of course, we've seen why they chose the ministry of the word, but today we want to see why they chose the ministry of prayer. But before we look at this passage that we've just read briefly, let us refresh our memories of what we studied last Sunday. We actually talked about the ministry of reconciliation which is also the ministry of the word of God that we've been given. We said reconciliation means restoring broken relationship to its original state of peace. We pointed to Genesis 1 and 2, where the harmony that existed be between humanity and God and between humanity and creation was perfect, absolutely perfect. It was a harmonious relationship but this peaceful and harmonious relationship was broken as we encounter chapter 3 of the book of Genesis because of what happened, the rebellion of humanity towards God's instruction. And so we looked at three points uh, in that sermon. We talked about alienation, reconciliation, and the outcome of the reconciliation. And alienation actually happened because of the temptation that the devil or the evil one brought to Adam and Eve in the garden, and when they sin and rebel against God, what God told them not to do, it brought a broken relationship at four levels. And we mentioned these four levels is broken relationship with God, broken relationship with self, broken relationship with our neighbors, broken relationship with creation. But thanks to his plan of reconciliation through the cross 
And through the cross of Jesus Christ, we are reconciled back on these four levels of relationship. Praise the Lord. This is the working of God that we can reconnect back and regain what we lost in the Garden of Eden. We regain our position of relationship with God in, uh, that we Paul tells us in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that this very particular reconciliation made us new creation. We become new creation. God is beginning a new creation as the old creation. He gives us life just as he gave in the new creation and actually brings us back into that harmonious relationship both with him, with ourselves, with others, and with creation. And he also gives us the ministry of reconciliation. We become his ambassadors. We become his representatives. And as ambassadors, we carry the message of reconciliation. That is the word of God, that we preach the message of reconciliation to the lost world and invite them into this reconciliation with God. And we do that with an appeal. We do that with passion. We do that knowing that there is an eternal consequences. There is a destination that there is going to be a time of judgment. And because of that judgment, we dread that judgment and we actually step out and reach out to people who do not have this reconciled relationship with God. We actually reach out with a passion. With a passion. And we appeal. We make an appeal, almost like we beg. That is actually what that word means. We beg people, consider the danger and repent. So we turn to the message for today, focusing on the ministry of prayer. We are delving into an area that is critical to our Christian journey. We will take some time to evaluate our prayer lives and we will Pray specifically for the educational sector at the end of this message. As we go towards the end of this message, we're going to take time to pray as a congregation. Because this week is actually a week that the summer is over for those who are in the educational system. The disciples of Jesus have watched him pray regularly, sometimes very early in the morning and even sometimes all night that Jesus would pray. And one day, after such a very intense moment of prayer, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus' immediate response shows how he took the request seriously and gladly taught them how to pray. This is the only thing that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them. They did not ask Jesus to teach them how to heal, which is interesting, how to teach, which normally a student would want to be like his teacher. But that's not what they asked Jesus to teach them. They know that Jesus is a good teacher. In fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of the uh, 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 um, Jewish sects recognize the, that Jesus, his teaching is different. He teaches with one kind of authority that is different from the rest of the teachers of the law. They recognize that. And the disciples recognize that. But they didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to teach. Nor even cast out demons. Or perform signs and wonders. They could have asked, Lord, teach us how to walk on water. That would be cool, right? Just, you know, walking on water. In fact, Peter saw Jesus did that and he was so excited. He said, Lord, ask me to come. And Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the board and said, go in. But he lost it. Oh, teach us how to multiply five loaves of bread to feed thousands. Perhaps they could have asked, Lord, teach us how to raise the dead. Probably for me that would have been the best thing. Who wants to see his loved one die? But think about us asking Christ to say, Lord, teach us how to raise the dead. I would have had my, my mom and my dad, which I would have loved to have them, and my brothers who have gone to be with the Lord, I would have loved to have them. 
I would have exercised that authority and say, come back. We're not done with you yet. Interestingly, it was not any of these that, that attracted the disciples to take a posture of learning, to take a posture of being students. Instead, they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. So how many of us have mastered this area of prayer? We are experts. How, how, how many of you are experts? I only want to ask you to put up your hand. But just think about it. Have you conquered this area of prayer? Honestly, if you are, I would love to sit under you to learn how have you made it? How have you succeeded? I mean, think about Jesus praying all night. It would have bothered the disciples to wonder. So what is he saying all night? All night praying. I mean, one hour we come to pray and we are checking our time, right? Or you go to kneel down to pray one hour or ten minutes. You, your mind is crowded already with many things demanding your attention. You want to finish quickly to jump out to go catch up those things that are calling for your attention. Oh, how many of you don't feel that pressure? Your pastor does. He feels it. I feel it. Oh, in fact, there are some people who have conquered it that even in their congregation, they are called prayer warriors. Do you know that? Prayer warriors? Really? You are a prayer warrior. You've conquered that. You are a warrior. Well, who is not a warrior? As Christians, we've been enlisted. Remember that we have actually been... Actually, we've actually deprived, or God has deprived another kingdom of his citizens. When we became believers, when we were reconciled to God, Satan lost in his kingdom. And because he loses in his kingdom, he's not going to sit. No king will ever want to see his territory lost. He will fight back. He will fight back. So, so what were the disciples asking? Was, were they asking for, for, for a pattern or for a form of words to be used or just asking for general instruction on prayer? I think asking for words is almost like, okay, Lord, one hour is just too much. Two hours, 24 hours, a whole day, whole night. What should we say? When we determine to do that, what should we say? How should we say it? And in fact, they said, you know, John taught his disciples how to pray. Unfortunately, we don't have the record of what the prayer of John was. But we have the record of Jesus' prayer. So Jesus said, when you pray, say. When you pray, it's like he gives them words to say. When you pray, say, Father. That is where we begin. That is the beginning point of prayer. Father. Father. Abba. Daddy. I am before you. I kneel before you, Father. I kneel before you, Daddy. Think about a child who comes to you and kneel. In, in, in my culture, that's not going to be uncommon. In fact, there, is some, there are some cultures back in Nigeria, you actually even go prostrate, you actually fall down before your father or you fall down before any other person. Some people will say, call that you are worshiping the individual. No, 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 it's not worship. It's actually the culture of the people. But think about your son coming to you or your daughter coming to you and kneeling down in humble contrition and saying, Daddy, I have this request before you. That act alone, that act alone is an act that can break the heart of an evil father. Remember, Jesus said, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts, how much more of your father? But think about your daughter or your son coming and kneeling down before you and presenting a request. 
This is how the Bible reveals God to us. He is God the Father. And another outcome of reconciliation we would have said last Sunday is that when God reconciled us, he, he I mean, reconciled, uh, reconciled us, he added us into his family. We became members of his family. We become his adopted sons and daughters. That is why Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Daddy, Father. It is, it is something that the one who has not received that power has not capacity and has no capability to do that. If he does that, it might just be probably out of formality, but not in that deep connection of reconciliation that has already taken place. So think about that. In John chapter 1, verse 11 to 13, we read these words. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. That is Israel. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God, <coughs> children born out of natural descent, no, no, not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So Jesus has, has explained, has explicated God, who God is. That is why when the disciples said, show us the Father, they said, well, I have been with you all this while. You are still asking. You have not seen the Father in me. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Because he is the one that exegetes. He explicates, he explains the Father to us. And so the Bible, this is how we encounter God in the Bible. It is he who revealed himself to us. Otherwise, we, there is no way humanity can know God. Because we're already separated from him. If he did not reveal himself to us, we have no way of knowing him. This truth is at the heart of the Christian theological battle today. As we know, some people pray. They recognize that Jesus has taught us this, but it's almost like playing Jesus and said, Jesus didn't do it well. We live now. And for, for us to say, Father, we are discriminating. And therefore, people who agitated that say we need to add mother. And in fact, some people will say our mother instead of our father. Or they will say our father and mother. What is wrong with that? Well, everything is wrong with that because we did not reveal God to ourselves. This is the scripture that we inherited. This is the tradition that is handed down to us. In fact, this is the contention that brought about the, cano I mean, the, uh, the canonization of this scripture. To say, look, there are heresies, there are wrong doctrines being taught out there. There are false teachers out there. And our brother, Matt Flores, taught us a couple of weeks ago about false teachings out there. But it didn't start today. What is happening today is not new to the Christian journey or to the Christian gospel. It's been a battle. It's been a battle. It's just, it's, 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 it's been repackaged and handed down to us as if it's something new. No, it's not. It's not. If God did not reveal himself to us, we have no way of knowing him. And he chose to reveal to us himself as father. <laughs> there is an article that I read, Bruce Metz Metzger wrote an article, Theological Implication of Inclusive Language in the Biblical Translation. He says, towards the conclusion, in the simplest terms, 
We call God our Father because Jesus has taught us to do so. And to cease so to call him is to cease praying as Jesus enjoyed us to pray. This is a revelation given to us by God himself. And so when we choose to follow the crowd, when we choose, in fact, there is a lot of translations that are being edited and revised today and actually removing where, uh, you know, this concept appeared in the Bible as father, son, and all of that. That have been revised today and those have been removed. And you've got to be careful. In fact, I will encourage that you keep your old versions of your hard copies of the Bible very tight with you, please. I, I truly encourage you to, because if you take the modern versions, most of them, especially those that are online, as, and as you know, everything is going digital, most of those things today are being edited. And so you read one scripture, and you say, oh, I mean, you read it from your gadget, and it sounds so strange. It's a familiar verse to you, but it sounds so strange. It's like something is missing here. Well, that tells you that you've saturated yourself with the word of God. You are a student of the word of God. When you read something like that online or from your gadget and realize something is missing, it's actually that sensors, those antennas, those spiritual antennas that you've developed, that sensitivity, that saturation of yourself with the word of God is what is bringing that self-realization and self-awareness. Something is fishy here. And then you go back to your old translation and you really see that, yes, something has been edited out and something new is put in the scripture. It's been tempered with, yes. It's been tempered with. And tempering with the word of God, right. And actually tempering to what has been handed down to us as the word of God. Human beings are tempering with it and they seem to be winning. They seem to be winning. God have mercy. Have mercy. See, in this age and time, if you choose to stay orthodox, if you choose to stay with what has been handed down to us, you are giving names. And those names are given to put pressure so that you cave in, to shame you to cave in and surrender. Many, many years ago, I read, I, I used to, even before I was married, in the, in the, in the, in the early 90s, I started reading a devotional called Every Day with Jesus. And I remember in one of the editions, the author said, we, we, we make this statement uh, that if you cannot beat them, what should you do? You should join them. If you cannot beat them, join them. Well, he said, no. If you cannot beat them, stay. Did you hear that? If you cannot beat them, what should you do? Stay. Well, here's the problem with that. If that is where the majority is going and you stand here, you are alone, right? Or the pressure is going to be on you. The light will be on you. Look at him. Look at him. That is the pressure that is being put on the church today. But God is revealed to us as Father. In fact, perfect Father. Some of us, because of our experiences with our earthly fathers, we project those bad experiences with our earthly fathers towards God. And once we hear God as Father, that is what declouds our mind. No, it should be the other way around. It should be the other way around. I am not a perfect father. But God is a perfect father. Both me and my children should see God as their example, as someone that we should follow and that we should want to be like him. Because his character is trustworthy because his character is perfect. Because when he says yes, 
it is yes. When he says no, it is no. And when he says no, it is for our own best interest. So, brothers and sisters, our beginning point of prayer, one of my pastors back in Kentucky has a way of praying every of his time praying. This is how he begins his prayer. And I was fortunate to be in Kentucky this past uh, few weeks, and I was able to meet with him. He's, he's a mentor to me. And as we sat and talked about leadership in the church, he prayed for me, and I got to hear him say, kind father. That is how he begins his prayer. Kind father, kind father. And our God is a kind father. And that is where our beginning point of our prayer should be. And how should we do? Hallowed be your name. To hallow God's name is to yearn for the name of the Lord to be sanctified, to be shown holy. Israel was aware of this expectation. In Leviticus chapter 22, verse 32, we read, Do not profane my holy name, for I must be acknowledged as, a, as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who made you holy. And that is not just only the expectation to the Israelites in the Old Testament. Look at what Peter says to the church in 1 Peter chapter 1. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. This is what Jesus was teaching the disciples. As you come to this father, this is who he is. As you address him, you also need to sanctify his name. It's not just only saying holy is your name, but it's like I am living my life in holiness. I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a disgrace to you in my place of work. I'm not a disgrace to you in my society. I'm not a disgrace to you, to my neighbors. I live and honor you and sanctify your name even amongst my peers. When they say, let's go do this, I said, no, I cannot be company with the wicked. I cannot join you, God. Do. I mean, so they say, so why do you do? Why is it that you don't do what other people do? Why is it that you don't enjoy life? That is what they say. That's always why they want to put pressure on you. It's like you are missing out something just simply because you are living a life that honors God, living a life recognizing that this body is, a, is, is the temple of the Lord. When you recognize that as a young person, you recognize that this body is the holy temple of God. It's no longer Jerusalem. By the way, that temple is no longer there anymore. Our own bodies have become the temple of the living God, where God lives. And therefore, I choose not to participate in certain things, not because of anything, but because I want to honor God with my body. I want to honor God with my body. It's a gift. The body you carry with you is a gift of God. So, Father, hallowed be your name, not just from my lips, but that from my life, I want to honor you. It could be a declaration, it could also be a desire. It's almost like you are committing yourself to the Lord, I want to live for you, I want to honor you, I want to glorify you with my body and with my life. And so that gives you a theological grounding of prayer, that prayer is rooted in our own understanding that God is a father and that his name is to be holy and sanctified even through our lives. Your kingdom come. The kingdom of God is the reign of righteousness and justice. Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 7, which is a very good place, Ren Kennelly has a song with that David, I'm sure you know that. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. How may this understanding that we are praying that when we enter into that prayer, so think about it. If you, if you, if you are thinking about how can I pray for one hour, for three hours, for four hours, for five hours? 
and then you enter into prayer and you actually want to focus on just the names of God. Do you know how many names of God are there in the Bible? 100 and something, right? Or, or maybe, I, I, don't, I don't know the number. But just think about just focusing on that. If you are to focus on that alone, Jehovah Ralpha, Jehovah Prohe, Jehovah El Shaddai, and all of, all of those names of God as he revealed them in the Bible. You are just to focus on that. Just that alone. Or, or, or you want to say, okay, I want to pray and surrender the area of my influence, my home, my neighborhood, my workplace, the gym that I go to exercise, the market I go to shop, all of the places you travel to and interact with people every day. Think about that. That you are saturating your time of prayer with that focus in mind. Oh, you are actually transitioning to say, you are kingdom come. You are will be done on earth. God has his kingdom. And his kingdom is what Christ has come to break through. To bring it to, that is why he announced, repent for the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God, the reign of God, righteousness. Don't you hear the cry of righteousness in what we see today around nations? The cry for justice among nations. The cry of justice in Palestine. The cry of justice in Nigeria. The cry of justice among the Uyghur Muslims in China. The cry of justice among the small minority of faithful Christians in North Korea. The cry of justice in Venezuela. The cry of justice in Rwanda. Do you know? Have you heard? The cry of justice in America. Have you heard? Do you know? But that when we kneel in prayer, Jesus is teaching us, we can actually cry out to God and say, let your kingdom come. Let righteousness reign. Let righteousness reign. That is what we are asking God to lead us into. How may this kingdom-focused prayer affect the way we pray in this year of election? Seasons like this can be very traumatizing and confusing and bring all manner of pressure and all of that. But you know what? The Bible tells us it is God who put leaders in the place of leadership and he is the one who brings them down. That's what the Bible says. He puts leaders in places of authority and he brings them down. Whether those leaders went into those places of authority by the ballot or by the barrel of the gun or in by whatever or by rigging, which happens in my own context. People have lost confidence in the election, in the electoral process, in my own context, completely. Completely. And today, we are reaping the consequence of that. But you know what? God, God is still God. In the midst of that confusion and trauma and the pain, people are dying as a result. Yet, that even aggravates and makes that cry of the kingdom of God to come. And we can also say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come even now. Let this kingdom permeate everywhere, permeate the places of darkness. Even where we think that darkness is taking over, we call upon the kingdom of God to permeate it. Because where the kingdom of God permeates, darkness disappears. Give us each day our daily bread. Daily dependence on God for provision. This is one prayer that today in some places when they say it is just mere formality. But in some places when people pray every morning give us this day our daily bread. They truly, 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 truly trusting God for at least a meal. In fact, 
I sat in a Bible study one time, and I think I've told you this story here. Just permit me, because it, it, it actually uh, uh, demands this, um, uh, you know, this very particular point. I sat in the Bible study, and we were studying the book. I think it was uh, this very particular passage, or the one in Matthew. And, <clears throat> and somebody said, oh, yeah, you know, when, when, when people read that prayer and say, give us this day our daily bread, they think that Jesus was talking about physical bread, that Jesus wasn't talking about physical bread. Ah, I couldn't keep quiet. I said, I said, sir, I mean, yeah. so, so I said, so what was he talking about? He said, he was talking about his word. I said, no. Only? Is that what he was talking there? Only? He said, yes. It's not about physical bread. And I said, well, but I know people who pray this prayer. In fact, the reason why they pray this prayer is because they believe that God is only God who can provide daily bread. They know. They know. Now, here's the reverse. What, what about, so, so how does this apply to someone who, who has everything in the food pantry that can take him over a year and uh, the refrigerator is filled? In fact, this happened during COVID, right? COVID, there was a panic buying that grocery stores went empty. All the shelves went empty. So how, how did people pray around that time about this prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. Well, Jesus Christ taught us an example. Look at everywhere that Jesus Christ had food before him. What does he do? He offered thanksgiving. He offered thanksgiving to the Father who provides. And so the practice of saying grace before meal. I tell you, it's a practice that reminds us of this very particular prayer here. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it for granted. When you have food before you, remember to pray. If you are too hungry that you couldn't remember to pray after you finish eating, still thank God. Seriously, prayer doesn't have to be after, before you eat. Even after you've eaten, thank God for providing. In fact, it's going to be more meaningful. Probably we need to start to reverse it. It's going to be meaningful after you've eaten that sumptuous meal and it's so sweet and satisfying that you offer thanksgiving to God. But Jesus taught us he offers thanksgiving to God when food is presented before him. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Really? If the forgiveness that we receive from God is to be contingent upon our own forgiveness of those who sin against us. Now remember the Psalms we read. If you, O oh God, were to keep record of sin, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness so that you are feared. You know, see, the idea of that Psalm is that you committed a sin that is so heinous that you think that God is going to kill you and God forgives you. His forgiveness creates fear. Just his act of saying, I forgive you, creates fear. Reverence, fear are from us. That is what we find here. Jesus did not commit any sin that he needed to confess. Did you know that? Jesus did not commit any sin. He, when he taught us to pray, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, it's not because Jesus Christ had any sin to confess to the Father. In fact, in all of the gospel records, we have no anywhere Jesus actually prayed and asked God to forgive his sin because he didn't commit any sin. He didn't commit any sin. He is the second Adam who came to live, to show us how we can live in obedience because the second Adam, I mean the first Adam lived in disobedience and in disobedience and brought shame and disgrace to us. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, came to show us how humanity can live in honor to God. So Jesus did not commit any sin that he needed to confess. Instead, on the cross, as he bore our sins, 
he asked the father to forgive those who crucified him. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if the rulers of this world knew who they were dealing with, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But they didn't know. Again, the author of every day with Jesus that I have referred to, he said one time, he said, if what that means is that if the devil knew that instigating the, the, the Jews to, to the uprising that crucified Jesus Christ, if they knew, if the devil knew that that was going to be his defeat, he said what he would have done was to make sure that there was no tree standing in Palestine that a beam for the cross would have been made out of. He would have leveled everything if he knew. But because the enemy, the devil, is limited, he didn't know. He instigated for Jesus to be crucified, and that was his defeat. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. This is Paul talking to the Ephesians church. He said, look, we have, been, we have received forgiveness. We've, been, we've received forgiveness from God. Let us be kind and forgive one another when they sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. No temptation, uh, the Bible says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not lead you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God will provide a way out in every temptation. So what that means is that, look, we are saying to God, God, Jesus is teaching us, you, we should pray that God should not lead us into temptation. Well, yes, that is a prayer that we can pray. But what about if we deliberately take ourselves and put ourselves in a place of temptation? When we sin, we shouldn't blame God. By the way, temptation in itself is not sin. It's yielding to it that is sin. Otherwise, Jesus was tempted by the devil. Three temptations. If temptation itself were to be sin, Jesus Christ would have actually committed sin because the devil tempted him. And that is why we read, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and temptations, but one who has been tempted, knowing exactly how it feels to be human, in every respect as, as we are yet without committing sin. Jesus Christ was tempted, you say, in every way, yes. In every way, yes. In every way that you think humanity could be tempted. If you have ever gone through any form of temptation, ever, that the weight is so heavy to you, you have a savior you can call to. That is what Paul says. He will provide a way out so that you can endure. Actually, other versions say so that you can stand and you are not laying flat. So that you can stand. God will provide a way. When there is temptation, he will provide a way. He is a faithful God. Temptation itself is not sin. Yielding to temptation is sin. So look at what, as we try to draw to a close, after he has taught them how to pray, well, they ask, teach us. There used to be uh, um, um, uh, a TV program in Nigeria uh, each time uh, the author, uh, I mean, the, uh, the anchor will introduce the program. He say, you ask for it, and here it is. You ask for it, and here it is. The disciples say, teach us to pray. Teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father. And then he taught them all through. Then he proceeded from verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight. Now, when we read stories like that, in our current context, it doesn't make sense, but this is the context of the Middle East in the first century. And it hasn't changed that much. It hasn't changed that much. It's the culture you find in Asia. is the culture you find in Africa. Culture of hospitality where someone can actually knock at your door at 12 o'clock midnight unnoticed. You don't have to receive any notice for someone, a neighbor, to knock at your door asking for something. In fact, it's even common among women. If a woman is cooking and turns around and realizes there is no salt, it's not uncommon for a woman to come to your door and knock 
and asking for. So it doesn't matter any time of the day. So, 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 so this can be a little bit confusing, but just think about it. This guy comes at midnight and knocking. I have a guest who just came in and I needed three loaves of bread to provide for him. And the one who is inside said, no, 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 don't disturb me because I'm already on bed with my children. Please don't disturb me. And the other one stands where, but I do not have anything and still continue to knock. And God, I mean, and Jesus said, if that man will not stand up and open the door and offer bread because of friendship, he will offer bread to say, just leave me alone. Take it and go. Take it and go. And then he went on to say, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks, I mean who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers? Which of you fathers? If your son asks for, br- I mean for, for fish, you give him a snake. Or bread, or you give him scorpion, or stone. <laughs> I wanted to say that if that child is actually uh, hungry, hungry, really hungry, and you do that, he can stone you with that same stone that you've given to him. Because that, that child will realize, what kind of a father are you? You do this to me? I'm hungry. I'm asking for bread. You give me snake, scorpion. No, no father ever does that. Now, here's, here's where we can tell people who say, oh, why do we have to address God as father and not mother? Well, they, go check. The reason why we don't even see mothers doing, I mean, uh, uh, Jesus giving the illustration about mother. No mother will ever think doing that. I'm telling you. Probably fathers can. But the mother, no. Absolutely no. And there are no shortage of metaphors in the Bible that describe God as a mother, as a, as, as a mother hen protecting the chickens. In fact, it says, look, a mother may forget a baby by her, I mean by her breastfeeding. A mother may forget. Maybe sleep, you know, kind of doze off and forget that she's breastfeeding. But you know what? That God will never do that. So God is a perfect God who provides like a mother will provide and provide it per excellence. That is the kind of God we are serving. And here, no mother will do this. I guarantee you. Probably fathers might. And he say, if you fathers who are wicked know how to do this, how much more of our father will give you the Holy Spirit when you ask of it? So that principle kind of tells us, takes us to something that I want to recap, just three principles very quickly as we run up. One, it takes the confidence of a child-father relationship for us to pray to God and say, Father. God is our Father who has granted us limitless access. That is what you read in the book of Romans chapter 5. We stand in the presence of God because we have access to him. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Do you have time of need? Approach the Father with confidence. It takes humble persistence in asking, seeking, and knocking, but also checking your motives for doing so and surrendering to the will of the Father because he is a kind Father. He is a good Father. He knows what is dangerous for you. And if you ask what is dangerous, he will not give you. He will not give you. That is why we read in James, 
you desire but you do not have. So you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. A wise father is able to differentiate when the asking is not wise. He knows the danger of granting that request. And a wise father will withhold. So, not asking and asking amiss, not asking and asking foolishly is the same. Not asking, you don't receive because he didn't ask. Even though he's a generous God, but he also knows how to actually deal with us. He wants us to ask. A father has pride when his son asks. A story is told of a church that recognized a neighborhood in where the church is located. So they will plant Christmas gifts and they will take it to give uh, to those uh, you know, poor families. And they realized that on two occasions, two Christmas, they took the gifts and they only met the mothers and the children and no fathers. And they took somebody who was very observant and said, so where are the fathers? And then they researched and realized that because they were poor, even though this church is trying to help, when they come to give, they are there, but they will hide because it's shameful for their children to receive gift from other people and not from them. So you know what they did? They changed. They actually invited the parents and gave them the gifts so that they have the dignity so it's not every father that can provide when a child asks. It's not every father. If you are able, thank God. If you are able to provide for your child, thank God. Children, if your parents are able to provide for you, thank God. Sometimes we live in a culture where children nowadays think that they have right to demand. You don't demand, you ask. You ask. You ask. If you demand, a kind father can gently refuse you. It's not that your father doesn't love you. No, your father loves you. Your mom loves you. But we've got to cultivate the attitude of humility because that is the entire aspect of this sermon is our humble posture before God when we come to ask him. Lastly, But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. This is in Matthew chapter 6. All. Remember, the disciples, they could have asked the, uh, Jesus to teach them how to heal, how to raise the dead, how to multiply bread. No, no, no. They knew if they ask and know how to pray, these other things may come true. In fact, at one point, somebody brought his sick child to the disciples to cast the demon out. The disciples did all the rigmarole, all the you know, the jumping and dancing. And the demon just stood there staring at them. Jesus came and said, what happened? He said, I brought my child sick to your disciples to heal him. But they couldn't do it. He said, oh, what a faithless generation. And he said, this kind cannot go except by prayer and fasting. Did you hear that? Except by prayer and fasting. And Jesus cast out the demons. The disciples should have said, so how did you do it that easily? Teach us how to cast out this so now. In fact, one time when he sent them out two by two, they came back and they were giving the report. They said, oh, even the, the, the sick were healed. They said, don't rejoice because of that. In fact, I saw Satan falling from heaven. There are some people who take pride take, telling themselves to be demon bulldozers and all of that. Be careful. Be careful. That is not where to glory. That is not where our glory should be. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and every other thing shall be added to you. So, how should we pray? 
How is your prayer life, brothers and sisters? Where are you in the school of prayer? Are you in the kindergarten? Are you in grade one? Are you a senior? Are you in college? Have you graduated? Where are we in our prayer lives? What if we declare one day in this church and say we're going to pray all day, 24 hours? How is that going to be? Have you done that before? Here. You've prayed for 40 days. I saw it. So how did you pray for 40 days in January? This, you did that this year, right? Right? Diana, where is she? Did we, did we do that this year in this church? I thought we do that every January. Yeah. But we do. So if we call a 24-hour prayer, or we call one night and say, let's come and pray all night, how will it look like? In Nigeria, when we were youth leaders in the 90s, we suffered in the hands of elders. I'm telling you, elders persecuted us. They called us all manner of names. We're radicals, blood-sucking demons, because we demanded that they should give us permission to come into the church and pray all night. I'm telling you, that was just the reason. They blackmail us. But a lot of youth took the stand and stood. Some churches are standing in our own country today because the youth were determined to pray. They were determined to pray. And we pray all night. And one of the effects of prayer, you know, sometimes zeal without knowledge is not good. We prayed one time, all, all night prayer, and then we went for a youth meeting from morning till evening. And I developed an eye problem as a result of that. Uh, I've, I think I've, I'm healed now. But it, uh, no, actually I'm not healed. If I drive in the night, it actually reminds me of that impact of that very particular foolishness. Because you don't do that. Even though we're young, no one taught us to take care of this body, to rest. And that is why Jesus himself would ask his disciples to come to him and rest. So let's pray. Let's pray. Let's, let's, let's put this in practice, and I hope that you've been motivated. In fact, let me actually encourage you. If you go to your app and Google um, Truth, Truth for Life, Alistair Beggs, he has a series of preaching on each of these items that I have just mentioned. Full series of 34, 40 minutes of preaching on each of these items, on Father, on hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. All of those sections, full series of, of sermons. You can listen, and I guarantee you, you will be blessed. If you saturate yourself, you want to be a student of prayer together. We can learn from others whom the Lord has blessed the church with. So let me request for those who are administrators in the school board. If you're a member of a school board or principal, can you stand? Those of you who are principals or uh, you are um, uh, a leader in either homeschooling and all of that, can you stand? For those of you who are, for those, where's Suzanne? Because uh, she also runs the Happy Hearts here, right? So, team, stand on her behalf. She is in the stand on her behalf. Where, where, where are the rest of the leaders? Stand, stand. Okay, where are the rest? Where about teachers? Teachers, those of you who are teachers in public schools and in Christian schools, can you stand, please? Stand. Okay. And what about those of you who are students who will be resuming back to school this uh, fall? Can you stand, students? Stand. And parents, parents, stand. We want to pray for you. Parents who are sending their children to school. Can those of you who stand, I mean, who sit by these people, if you are able to stand, can you go around them? We're going to pray for them. Please go around them, and we're going to lay hands, put your hands on them. 
Please stand, if you are able. If you are able to stand, let's go around these people that are standing by us, and then we pray for them. And I hope you know, I mean, begin to pray now. Whatever the Lord is laying in your heart, to pray for the administrators, pray for teachers, pray for students, and pray for parents. Whatever the Lord is laying in your heart, begin to pray right now. You can pray aloud as the Lord leads you. You can pray aloud as the Lord leads you right now. Pray. Pray that God is going to provide. We know the situation of schools in Washington State. There are some districts that are not able to fund their education. And as a result, some people have lost their position. Can you pray that God, who is able to provide, can provide resources so that those who are administering these resources will not have to struggle and have nightmares? Let's pray for the leaders, please. Pray for them right now. Pray. In fact, right here we have our sister. She's not here today, but uh, Michelle, she's a principal. Uh, Andrea, she's a head of... um, uh, 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 homeschoolers. Let's pray for all of these people as you can remember them by their names and those of you that you are having your hands around them. Please, let's pray. Pray, pray whatever the Lord is. I'm not hearing you pray. Pray, I said you can pray aloud. We will allow you to do that in this, cl- uh, in this church, even though we're not Pentecostals. <clears throat> Pray that they will honor God and glorify God in their classes, in their leadership, that they will demonstrate that they are leading with the wisdom of God. Pray for changes that are taking place in our schools, in our public schools, that are bringing a lot of hardship to our teachers, that God will give them wisdom to navigate those difficult moments and showcase the wisdom of God in their teaching, in their classes. Pray for grace that each day they wake up, they will go with motivation to be disciples of Christ in their classrooms, to represent Christ in their teachings, to represent Christ in their leadership, and to honor God in where they are serving. Pray for the students. A lot of students find learning very, very difficult. Let's pray and support our students and encourage them that they can do it, will become their cheerleaders and say, you can do it. Some have done it and you can do it. You can ask for wisdom for that math that is so difficult. Ask for wisdom for English. I don't know how students in America have problems with English, but we can pray for them. Pray that God will give them ease and understanding. Pray for students of history. Pray for students of art. Pray for creativity that students will actually learn and learn knowledge that is adequate for them and that they will be able to find pathways even in high school, going to college, as to what God wants them to do. Pray for parents, for provision, for waking up, prepping the children every day to send them to school, for grace, for patience, for endurance, for peace. that they will not exacerbate the children and add to their burden of learning, but that their help and their presence at home will be a support that will make learning easier for these students. Let's pray for our unhappy hearts here, that God will bless our sister Suzanne as she leads and organizes these uh, our parents who, who trust us with their children, who bring their children here, for us to nurture them in these early years of preparing to go to school, that our ministry would be effective to these children. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your church. Thank you that we have this privilege that we can stand in the gap for your people, that we can stand in the gap for the school district, that we can stand in the gap for the school board, that, Lord, we pray for wisdom and we pray for your fear, O God, to these school boards as they meet and take decisions to appropriate funds, O God, 
that they will know that they are handling the future of the next generation, that they are handling the future of this country, that they will make wise decisions to appropriate funds that will, that will aid and alleviate the burden of teaching and the burdens of teachers, the burdens of the administrators. I pray, oh God, for our brothers who are, who are administrators themselves, the Lord amidst this lack, amidst these constraints, amidst these financial constraints, oh God, that there will be wisdom and there will be uh, prudence, oh God, integrity in handling those resources so that, Lord, these resources will be appropriated well to give support to the teachers that are in the trenches teaching these children every day in their classrooms. I pray, oh God, that there will be discipline, that there will be an understanding of discipline, discipline that truly brings about character. Please, Lord, we ask of you discipline that will bring character. May these children, oh God, that we are sending to these public schools and to Christian schools, that they will realize that they are representative of God, that they will be able to say to their fellow children who do not have the values they, that they have, that they are privileged to be raised by Christian parents, that these children that you've gifted us in, Christian, in Moses Lake Alliance Church will be able to say, no, 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 we can't do this. Because if we do this, we are adding burden to our teachers. Can we respect our teachers and make their work easier? Please, Lord, bless our children. That, Lord, those of them that are struggling with learning, those of them that are struggling with math, with English, with any subject, chemistry, physics, calculus, all of those subjects, oh God, we ask in the name of Jesus, you are the fountain of wisdom. Could you, trust, could you help them to trust you as a kind father who truly say, you do not have because you don't ask. So, so you are having difficulty in math. Have you prayed? You are having difficulty in English. Have you prayed? You are having difficulty in calculus. Do you know God does calculus? Have you asked him to help you? He's a master teacher. Pray. And Lord, I pray for parents. I ask, oh God, that you will help these parents as they prepare these children. This week will be a week of shopping. Help them to be wise. Help them to know what these children truly need. The Lord, when these children come back from school, oh God, help that there will be that time created so that they can connect and know what these children are struggling with. Please, Lord. Shield these children from any evil influence. The times are hard. The times are hard. The war is raging. Thank you, Lord, that you are such a good God that we can call upon you. We thank you for the Happy Hearts ministry here that teachers within the neighborhood trust us to bring their children here to be. Yes, and you've blessed us with the facility. So we pray for Suzanne. We pray for the teachers who dedicate their time with little earning, yet they do it happily. May your blessings rest upon them, O oh God. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for answering us, O oh God. We pray all of this with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you.